Snackers, Matt DiNapoli here. I'm a manager of developer advocacy with Cisco DevNet. Hello, Snackers. This is Kareem Iskander. I'm a tech advocate with Cisco Learning and Certifications. Welcome to episode 62 of DevNet Snack Minute. DevNet Snack Minute is your weekly 10-minute all things DevNet, giving you a fun way to learn about Cisco APIs, coding, and just some cool stuff that we do here. And uh, we have a returning guest today. He was with us a few months ago to talk about an introduction to FSO. Uh, but now today he's here to talk to us about uh, open source hyper-converged hyper -converged infrastructure. Uh, Mel, if you don't mind introducing yourself and then uh, maybe telling us a little bit about what hyper converged means. Yeah, well, let me start by introducing myself and uh, thanking you again for having me back. Uh, I'm Mel Delgado, developer advocate at Cisco. A little bit about uh, hyper-converged infrastructure. So um, when approaching virtual machines, right, and we're, when we're talking about virtualization, we typically organize those conversations around compute storage, network, and virtualization. So uh, in the past, or actually even today, uh, the technology exists where you can have all of those pieces be separate components. You can buy storage from storage vendors, uh, networking uh, from networking vendors, uh, compute as in the servers and so forth uh, from, 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 from other vendors, right? Uh, when we talk about hyper-converged, we bring all that together in a single platform. In other words, one piece of hardware and then we scale that out. So we have multiple pieces of hardware to bring together those elements of compute, storage, network, and virtualization. That's, uh, that's really exciting. And because uh, I know that as we kind of talk about um, automation and programmability, it gets a little bit challenging as we kind of cover all of those areas in different ways, shapes, and forms. And it's fun to hear that those things are kind of coming together. I know that you want to talk about an open source solution that kind of manages that from a, from a um, uh, automation standpoint. Can you, can you talk about uh, what that project is and, and how it could be used? So when I was looking at virtual machine workloads in uh, a hyper-converged way, I was looking at open source solutions, potentially. How could we approach this from an open source perspective if you already have the compute? So one of the projects I ran into is uh, Harvester. So Harvester is a open source project that uses uh, cloud native, a cloud native approach to bring together Kubernetes, KVM, Kubevert for managing the, uh, the virtual machines, uses Longhorn for uh, persistent storage, as well as Multis for all the networking side of things. So when we bring it all together, we get Harvester. And in Harvester, what we'll be able to do, and I'll show you this here in just a moment, is we'll run virtual machine loads on Kubernetes and be able to orchestrate that uh, in a hyper-converged way with one uh, pane of glass, so to speak. So if it's running the VM workloads on Kubernetes, does it abstract away the fact that it's actually running on Kubernetes? So for you know the actual developer or the application deployment model, um, they're thinking they're deploying to a VM, not necessarily in a microservices architected way. Correct, yeah. So it, when we look at it from a like the big picture, why would we want to do this? Well, not everything is, uh, or not everything has been ported to or designed from the ground up as with microservices in mind. You're going to have workloads that are still virtual machine based. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, you can say, well, gee, you know, at least I can bring it together in an open source way, uh, using cloud native, uh, uh, a cloud native approach, if you will. So then, what will end up happening is that on top of that, you can run Kubernetes if you want to by deploying virtual machines, and on that, you can run your own Kubernetes clusters, and so forth. But in in uh, to answer your question, yeah, you, you if you're a developer and you're looking at it uh, from a from the through the lenses of hey, I have a virtual machine, it's just that it's because you have a virtual machine and you have the need for those workloads still. Okay, that makes a ton of sense. Okay, cool. I was actually I was going to ask you, uh, Mel, how does this compare to you know like a vCenter or you know even even like when we're looking at it from a Cisco perspective, you know why would I? What is the benefit of me going with other than it's open source with Harvester versus like an inner site? In general, when we're looking at vSphere, for example, as one of the options that's out there, it's a commercial option and it's not free. So sure, there's a trial license and so forth, but if you want to manage uh, virtual machines on-prem, uh, vSphere has been a fantastic choice for those that can afford it. Uh, sometimes, though, 
you know, you might be a shop that doesn't have the financial means to do that, perhaps, right? And maybe just want to take an open source approach. And that's where Harvester comes in. Um, where that fits in in the Cisco ecosystem is, well, we have the compute portion of it. And we have networking right. from the physical perspective. So if you're on-prem and you have uh, lots of compute available to you, but perhaps you don't have the funding available for going after, say, like for, to answer your question, the vSphere side of it, then maybe you could approach it from an open source perspective. Maybe, by the way, this could be your non-prod environment because you can spin up your virtual machines this way uh, and then use your vSphere licenses for prod. Uh, you know, whatever the mix may be, here's an alternative for doing this in a way that that uh, it, it, that takes an open source approach. And 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 I know you're gonna you're gonna show us a demo on how to leverage Harvester for your kind of your orchestration, but maybe you can also touch a little bit about. Um, around what happens after for optimization. Is that handled for me part of Harv Harvester, you know, resource management, all of that? Or, you know, or maybe you can show us that. Yeah. So, well, let me let me first start with uh, deploying virtual machines. And then I'll do those in a namespace. Uh, so then you'll see that isolation occur, right? Um, as far as the like the features that do the optimization, I'm not as familiar with it in Harvester. Uh, and I could just flat out say that commercial solutions like vSphere will do this exceptionally well. So I don't know how Harvester will hold a candle up to that, but at least let me show you from a virtual machine perspective how it all starts to come together. And you're going to see here on my left-hand side how I've got the console up for Harvester. On the right-hand side, I just have the terminal up just so I can show you how you're going to have virtual machines deploying into Kubernetes, and you'll see those Kubernetes workloads in, in, the, in the typical fashion, right? So I'll, I'll run kubectl commands, and you'll see those workloads in those namespaces. So first, let me start by, um, let's do a kube uh, ctl get namespaces. And I created a namespace just for our talk today, which is called Snack Minute. And so, uh, so we'll see our Snack Minute, uh, and then I'll show you a kubectl uh, get po or the pods in that namespace, which is snack minute. Okay, and we'll see that there are no resources, right? So not a lot of exciting stuff going on. So let's go over to virtual machines. So here's the up console. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna create a new virtual machine in the snack minute namespace. So let's take a look. So we'll just call this uh, snack uh, minute m. Okay, and then we will up. Uh, Give it two virtual CPUs. We have the option of doing that. We'll give it uh, a whopping four gigs of memory. Uh, and then we'll pick a volume, so a disk on which this will run. Uh, we have the option of, we've got lots of options. Uh, here's an image. So this kind of reminds me of another uh, virtual machine orchestration platform, which is going to be uh, OpenStack. So it's almost like an OpenStack approach, only we incorporate Kubernetes uh, and kubevert underneath the uh, underneath the covers. So, while you're doing this, I have a I have a silly question for you. Um, if we have Kubernetes, why are we deploying a VM on top of Kubernetes as opposed to containerizing this? Lift and shift doesn't work all the time. So, in other words, if you have a virtual machine workload, uh, lifting, shifting, and making that a container is sometimes architecturally not really a, a great approach. So to answer your question, because uh, then it's like, well, wait, why do we need that, right? Why don't we just containerize it to begin with? Well, not everything translates that well. So, um, and again, it's just one of those things. Sometimes you've bought this proprietary software that was built in a monolithic way, and you just need it because it hasn't been built in a microservices, uh, using microservices, uh, a microservices architecture. So it hasn't been built that way, but you still have it, you know, in your enterprise, perhaps um, it's a super important thing to have and, and continue running it. So this way, at least you get to have best, best of both worlds. All right. So we're going to look and we'll see that the, the virtual machine is now running as a Kubernetes pod. So then when you bring it all together, now what you're looking at is you're combining sort of that, that that ethos, if you will, of cloud uh, using a cloud native approach, right? So now you're always thinking, you know, in containers. You're thinking as uh, you know as as running something in Kubernetes. So you're thinking Kubernetes pods and so forth. So you're you're taking that same approach consistently, even if you're bringing in uh, virtual machine workloads. 
Mel, this is this is fantastic and really exciting tool for for people getting started kind of in that space as well, it sounds like. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for this week and we really appreciate you coming back on again. And um, I do know that there is a follow up to this particular uh, conversation that we'll have uh, your colleague Jock Reed on for later. Uh, so snackers, stay tuned for that one. And uh, thank you guys for joining us for another episode of DevNet Snack Minute. Thank you, Snackers. Thanks, Mel. Hey, thank you.